Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Scientist Stuff Podcast. I, as always, am your host, Joseph Nowak. With me, as always, I have my co-host, Ethan. How's it going? I'm pretty good today. <laughs> and, as always, we have our bewildering moderator, Mr. Og. A new adjective every week. Well every played, week. Sir. We're gonna, yeah. I'm, gonna... I'm, I'm bewildering now, huh? Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll get a new one every week. This will okay. be the thing that... And uh, we have a special guest today, uh, Mr. Labuda. How's it going? Uh, it's going great. And glad I could be on. Sorry, what'd you say? I said uh, glad I could be a guest. Oh yeah, uh, glad to have you on. So today we are going to talk about uh, trick shots in sports. Why they happen? Why are they so more difficult, or, or they seem like? To defy the laws of physics, almost. Um, and Joe, I through. believe the word you're looking for is bewildering. Bewildering, <laughs> yeah. Uh, breathtaking, stupefying. I have a whole list up, honestly. Um, and uh, we're going to see, like, why they seem to defy physics. And then go into, like, a couple of examples, I believe, in, like, soccer and I think basketball were the two. Uh, but I think, we, Daniel, if you want to start us off, you know, how do these things actually happen or why do they seem to defy the basic laws of physics? Um, so I'd like to talk about the first article. Um, so in the first article, um, it talks about the Magnus effect, obviously, and how um, when a spin is applied to a cylindrical or sphere spherical object, uh, it produces lift because it alters the airflow around the moving object. Uh, and um, it also talks about like in different sports uh, such as golf baseball is a huge example like curveballs uh, um, and like all the different kind of throws that they have in baseball and um, another thing that I'd like to br uh, bring up which was actually at the end of the article which was the dam busters that um, yeah. Mark Wallace um, he thought about that idea so. Yeah, I saw the one at the end too. You know, when I first saw in the article before I saw the photo, I, I kind of envisioned it almost like as a torpedo or something. But then it, it shows like they're just like it's basically skipping a giant rock or a giant bomb into a dam, which is hilarious, honestly, and kind of interesting. You know, that's it's such an out there kind of uh, this theory or design. Um, Mr. Rock, I just had like a question. Maybe you were Labuda. Um, do you know what happens if you apply a spin to like a non-cylindrical object? You know how that would affect um its movement in the is there is there like a variation of the Magnus effect that happens or uh great question. Um I am not too sure on that because I don't know uh I don't know how much uh, how many studies have been done on uh, non-cylindrical objects rotating through the air? Uh, I'm not saying that there are not. I'm just saying I have not come across any. Uh, okay. So my, I, I think my research is a little limited here. Um, I, you know, the, the thing with, with cylindrical objects especially is um, that generally they tend to be more aerodynamic because they have slightly less drag. Yeah. Um, and so if you, if you start rotating other things that are flying through the air – you're going to take something that has a lot of drag and and introduce even more drag. And I, so, so I think one of the reasons that the focus is so much on uh, cylindrical or spherical objects is because they still do manage to fly through the air. Um, it's just you you see a very visible effect um, yeah. coming from the Magnus effect. Uh, Daniel, can you give us a, a, just a really quick summary in terms of the Magnus effect? What uh, let's Let's say I throw something. Let's say I throw a baseball with backspin. What is going to happen to the baseball? Oh, so this kind of leads me into the next article, which I, I actually found um, about like five main points of why uh, the Magnus effect happens. So, uh, so there's something called skin friction, which is a kind of drag. And mm -hmm. it exerts a force on the sides of uh, any ball as it flies through the air. And then 
when the ball spins, there one of its sides experiences more skin friction than the opposite side. Usually it's like the top and bottom, uh, which is in one of the diagrams uh, in the article. And so every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So when the ball travels through the air, it interacts with and uh, moves the air around it, which I kind of talked about in the first article. And the air doesn't just exert a force on the ball because of drag. The ball also exerts a force on the air because of drag. Um, and there's two other main points. Uh, the ball will always curve towards the direction it is spinning, which is actually a big part of it. And the spin of the ball decreases pressure on one side of the ball and it increases on the other. And this results in a difference in pressure, uh, which in turn produces the Magnus force, uh, which moves the ball and causes it to curve through the air. Huh? Yeah, that, that's, I think that's a part of the, that. So that for anyone wondering, that is the reason why, you know, a lot of these trick shots seem to defy physics or whatever. It's because, a lot of that spin makes it go into seemingly unorthodox directions. Um, but I think we can lead it in is that there are ways t- that people use this effect um, to their abilities or to their shots, and which is why we get trick shots. Um, so maybe if you want to start with a certain sport, I don't know if you want to start with like basketball or uh, soccer, like what are some ways that May people in those sports use the Magnus effect or techniques that they can use the Magnus effect in order to get like these weird angles? Um, yeah, we could start with soccer. So um, in soccer, if you're a soccer player, you know, you want to hit the ball a certain uh, part of the ball or yeah, you want to hit a certain part of the ball. So let's say you're trying to curve it. You'd want to hit more towards the middle so that it gets like a really good spin and it, uh, and you also want to hit it pretty hard. But like, uh, as we'll see later, um, one player, Cantona, he gets a chip shot. And on something like a chip shot, you want the power to come from under the ball. So pretty much it's about control and using the Magnus Force to like the best of your ability. So I think I know that like probably speed's a big part of it too, right? Because... I would assume if you kick the ball harder with like more force, you're probably going to see a larger Magnus effect just because the ball is going to be spinning more. Um, but the one thing I remember for the few years that I played soccer was like, you want to kick it on like the flat of your foot. Does that have anything to do with it? Or is uh, that yeah. more just power relay? Uh, that does have a big part of it. So like if you're passing, you likely want to hit it with like uh, the inside of your foot. Yeah. Uh, to get more accuracy. But then if you're going for power, like I said, you probably want to hit the ball towards the middle and you probably want to hit the, uh, hit the ball from like the more of the top of your foot. And uh, yeah. You bring up like accuracy too. Um, Like I know in soccer, there's a lot of precision when going between teammates and stuff. Is there any way that like when you're kicking, you try to limit the Magnus effect so that you can try and get like more accurate passes to each other? Um, uh, hmm. like, like when you're passing to someone, what's like the best part of the ball to hit? Or I'd say probably the middle and, the middle. um, yeah. And obviously with less speed, you get uh, way more accuracy. Yeah. So it's, it's easier to control the ball when you have less speed. So, yeah. So, so Daniel and Ethan, uh, you both play soccer, correct? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Daniel, what position do you normally play? Uh, I'm usually a right back. A right back. Okay. And Ethan, what position do you normally play? I play right back and like left back. And then also I like the midfield. You guys yeah. play the same position? Are you yeah. rivals? Do you vie for the si- – for- oh, man. Not um, really. So, so let's do it this way. When you are playing – are you actively thinking I'm going to put spin on this passer shot or is it just instincts at that point? Uh, I'd say it's a little bit of both. Okay. Um, like when, let's say there's pressure coming on and uh, 
Yeah, like, so let's say there's pressure coming onto you and you look up and there's no options open. And then you look up the field and you see uh, like a striker making a run. Okay. Uh, you you think to just play it up and like uh, try to put as much power on the ball. And, and if they're making like a diagonal run across, then you'd obviously want to put curve on it too. Sure. Ethan, Ethan, are you the same way? It's just sort of in the moment you you, you think I'm I'm either going to curve this or not, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, it is like for me at least. It's hard to like think sometimes exactly how you yeah. want to hit the ball exactly. So I just I kind of focus more on like just trying to get the ball where I need it, and sometimes it does curve pretty well when I need it to. And I think it's more maybe instinct, maybe like just. Accident, like an accident kind of where I placed it, but like it just works out in the end, I think. Yeah, because Daniel, one could argue, um, and based on some of the videos that you sent us, one could argue that who is the best at this? Oh, Messi. By far, right? And, and I would just love to talk to Messi in terms of like, do you think he is thinking about the Magnus effect when he's playing soccer? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, right. Um. I think I, he definitely thinks about where he is going to hit the ball because I know that all the time, like uh, um, Andy, who's our uh, free kick taker mm -hmm. uh, for Andy, he always thinks about where he's going to hit the ball and uh, how much curve he's going to put on it. So I'd say that Messi probably does. Yeah. But not necessarily the Magnus effect, but definitely where – He's going to hit the ball and how hard and speed, things like that. Sure. Uh, based on your answers, it, it sound, my guess would be almost that, you know, he, he, may, he might spend a lot of time in, like, training thinking about this, yeah. right, and experimenting and just kicking balls all over the place just so that he can get the feel so that come game time, he has sort of an innate understanding of it. But then, as you guys said, uh, it, it's just instinct that kicks in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Good oh. <laughs> yeah. So maybe like a difference. I, I want to maybe like transition to basketball now. Mm -hmm. um, so we got about 15 minutes left. Um, but I think I th thing with basketball is that, you know, a hand is a lot different from a foot. You know, the foot is a single, especially when you're wearing the shoe, it's like a single position that you can strike the ball with, where if you have a hand, you have a bunch of different ways you can contact it and, much like a lot of different like places of force you can exert on the ball just because of the nature of using a hand which also makes it a lot harder in some ways for like having to like calculate a lot of different forces but you know you get a lot more accuracy with the hand too which usually means you can apply like if you know the how the forces are going to act or how the magnus effect is going to work with basketball then you know you're probably going to have a uh more accurate shots and stuff. And, um, and, and Daniel, you sent out another article that did focus on basketball. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, now we're talking some projectile motion here, right? Yeah. Um, and there was, there was a scientist who did some studies. Do you remember what he found was the optimal angle to shoot the ball at? Uh, I believe it was 33 degrees. Um, or... He, let's see. I, I believe he said 33 was the uh, lower end angle. of it, right? He said he said nothing lower than 33 degrees. Oh, yeah. Um, but he did say optimal was that magic 45 40. degrees. Um, and then he did bring up the Magnus effect again because when you shoot a basketball, you're supposed to put backspin on it. Why? What does, what does that add to the shot? I think I read in this uh, article about like, um, tennis – if uh -huh. back, I think on the tennis ball so that it would create lift mm -hmm. for the ball so that it wouldn't just go like straight or just straight down kind of with gravity. So I feel I think the the backspin with the magnus effect on the basketball kind of keeps it gives it that arc that it needs to go in the hoop. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, you're right. It gives it a little bit more lift so that when it's coming down, it's coming down in, in a straighter path than it normally would, which gives the ball a better chance of going in. Mm -hmm. So abs that's, that is why you put backspin on a shot. Uh, but again, you're not really thinking about it in the game other than instinct kicking in, right? You work on the shot during practice, and then 
Um, it's funny, Dr. Fish and I were actually talking the other day about how uh, when, when you're shooting, as soon as the ball leaves your hand, you have a pretty good feeling of whether it's in or not. Um, and, I, and I think that's sort of the instincts that, that you guys were talking earlier about um, with soccer, right? You, 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 you train so much with it that you can kind of feel when, when you have done it correctly. Yeah. yeah, I think by like you that for years, it's almost extinctual at that point almost. Like you probably like, I played basketball for a bunch of years, but I, I, you would subconsciously may put spin on the ball, but you wouldn't really... I never like put the two and two together that, you know, putting the spin on it would lift it. I just knew that, you know, if you put spin, then it makes, there's a better chance of it going in. Yeah. Is there anything else in the articles you guys want to talk about? Maybe like for basketball, there's, you know, the force that you put on a basketball is a lot less than you would put on a soccer ball. Does that have anything, you know, you, you, there's not like a lot of these, you know, you see longer shots that prior due to the effect, but you don't see like these crazy curves that you see in soccer. True. Like, um, yeah. Daniel, you wanted to, to talk about uh, the buzzer beater that, that Notre Dame had a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and I think there is one added thing to that that we haven't talked about. Daniel, do you want to set up at least what was, what was going on? I, I, I'm sure if our listeners... Uh, are following Andy, they probably know what shot we're talking about, but but give us a little background. So, uh, uh, Andy was tied against, um, I forgot which team exactly, but um, in the like final couple 30 seconds of the game, uh, the other team missed the shot, and uh, one of our star players, Louis Lesman, got the ball, and he shot it from past half court and made it in and won us the game. Yeah, absolutely. And and so when you see and, – and we're talking three-quarter shot, right? This was, this was quite a heft. Um, when, you, uh, when you do a shot like that, what's the difference between uh, throwing it up like that and taking a jump shot? You definitely want to apply uh, more speed and force, mm -hmm. uh, less than like backspin, I would think. Uh, there's definitely some arc that you want to it, but you're definitely applying more force to the ball than you would regularly because you're obviously a lot farther on the, uh, from the basket on the court. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, is you kind of run into the shot a little bit. Yeah. Right. When we talk about projectile motion, we talk about two dimensions of motion. Right. And running into the shot is going to increase which component of the projectile initially? Horizontal. Yeah. The horizontal X component. Right. So, so the idea being, yeah, you are going to need to give it a little bit more force, but you actually like running forward helps because it, it gives that ball sort of that extra forward carry so that you shouldn't have to alter your shot too much, right? You still get the same arc, but now you have more forward momentum that is carrying the ball to the basket and to glory. Yeah. yeah. If there's anything anyone else wants to say about it, then unless that's it then well i guess if that's it then i think that's our episode for the day so thank you guys all for tuning in watching make sure you subscribe to the nd media channel and turn on the notifications so you can be notified whenever we put up a video so see you guys in the next episode and bye bye <laughs>